Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Bhutang dhammang sankhang Namasami. So here we are, it's the the big opositor. Uh, it's the new moon in June and as per usual, monks and nuns have uh, listened to the recitation of their rules in the morning. And then tonight, uh, lay residents have taken the eight precepts or reaffirmed their commitment to the eight precepts. And we've gotten a bit used now to Ajahn Amaro being absent, but he will be back again on the 4th of July along with Ajahn Konkrit. He'll be back from Thailand. And in a couple of weeks time plus plus, a little bit more, the community here in Amravati will be entering the Vasa 2022 with all that that means with the retreats and the teachings and everything else that goes on in the course of the Vasa. <clears throat> so all of this is pretty regular and pretty normal. But what's different is that it's against the background of the biggest move or biggest change in the monastery since the creation of this temple. So we, we are abandoning or have abandoned the main social hub, the sala, and a lot of buildings around the sala. We're in the process of abandoning them. And we've moved into smaller accommodation in what used to be the retreat center. And it's been a, a big transition. But I'd like to say first off that I think it's gone very well, uh, incredibly smoothly, considering everything that's had to be given up and the fact that the accommodation we're going to is a lot more cramped, people having to fit in with each other and, and find places for all the stuff they brought over. So it's been a pretty amazing transition and I'd like to, first of all to pay tribute to all those people involved with the transition, people in, uh, organizing it, planning it, and the people who helped to carry it out. Now that uh, doesn't mean to say there won't be problems, because in any such human situation, when you're going from a larger accommodation to a smaller one, there are li uh, likely to be problems, and teething problems, and issues to be settled. So, I know that there's more discussion needing to be had and people will need to sit around table and work things out, but I'm sure it will be worked out. This is something that can be settled over time as the community works out how best to use the new space or the, less, the, the, the lack of space they have. So. And I think gradually we're beginning to get used to these new set of circumstances. Perhaps it's easier for some than others. But the other week I wandered into the round to the back of the sala and had a look at, uh, I was standing around the back of the sala having a look at the gas tanks, noticing how the weeds are growing up around the gas tanks and flowers and things. And it, it felt to me rather like a, a deserted farmyard and then all the buildings empty and unused now. And then I thought of all the human activity that had gone on in these, those buildings for such a long time, almost 30 years, from 1984 up to this year. Uh, all, the, all the energy, the thought, the care, um, 
and the effort that went into making the place a comfortable place to live, uh, a good place for practice and a good place for receiving guests. All the refurbishments of the kitchen, the main kitchen there, um, the makeovers of the scullery and so forth, that the different boilers that went through the place, massive amounts of effort. And so, uh, for me, these buildings hold some memories. I thought I'd just sh share a few of them with you. Because sometimes being aware of what's gone before helps us to face the future. And there was an incident um, a few years ago which made me think about the Western attitude towards the past, that maybe we don't pay enough respect to what's gone before us, I don't know. But anyway, this was in the Bhikkhu Vihara, and we had a monk called Venerable Katanyato, who come, comes from or came from El Salvador. And uh, he said that he and a few others were, were gathered around for a discussion, and by chance that day, there were no Westerners. So there were no Americans or British, probably no Western Europeans there. And uh, so it was him from El Salvador, there was a Japanese Anagarika, and presumably there were a few other people from other cultures. And what did they choose to talk about? They chose to talk about something that they would never have talked about in front of Westerners. And that was... Can you guess? <laughs> the expectations of the ancestors. The expectations of the ancestors. So that's why I think sometimes it's good to think back to what happened before. So the first memory is of what we've been, up to now we've been calling the men's drying shed. So back in the mid 80s when I first came here that was um, a very dilapidated shed. It wasn't built um, beautifully. The, the internals weren't like they, were, like they are today or were today. It was very rough, very dilapidated, no insulation, rather rough place. But all across the site, there were rooms, there were sheds that weren't being used properly, that hadn't been assigned a particular purpose because the people, you know, there was just so much space and so many possibilities. So it in this particular shed, uh, that particular shed became the location for the smokers. So something like three, four, five people would congregate in that shed, smoke their fags and have a good chat. And that was allowed. And the second memory is of the building next to it, which is the men's, or was, sorry, the men's shower block. So I remember that the, 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 almost the day of completion of that, that people were so elated, there was so, such a sense of success and joy, and and they'd put in this marvelous uh, varnished wood ceiling, um, as well as all the showers and, and so forth, and uh, people were beginning to take their showers there, and uh, I remember the the smell of the freshly finished varnish was very pungent, very a general sense of elation around that uh, shower block. The next one is of the library, what was the old library. So this is 1985. And that was a shell too. It was a com utterly dilapidated uh, room with, with no insulation, very poor windows, um, and We'd had a monk arrive from Thailand. His name was Ajahn Santajito. So Lung Po asked Ajahn Santajito, he said, could you please turn this into the Christmas Humphreys Library? And if you went inside that building, there, was, there were piles of books everywhere, cartons full of books, because people had already started donating books. And um, it was utter chaos, actually. A few shelves... But what really concerned Ajahn Santachitto as he went about this task was he thought ahead to the winter and he thought, well, if anyone comes into this library in the winter, it'll be absolutely freezing. There's no insulation and hardly any heating. And we were insulating other parts of the site. So he 
decided to set about it himself. So he went and got some rock wool, which was the insulating material, and started stuffing it in. I saw him on his knees stuffing it into the wall, into the cavity of the wall. So that stayed in the memory. The next one is of what we've called up to now the monk's reception room. That was often where Lung Por Samedha would meet people and have important conversations. And he'd gone away, and he'd asked senior monks there, could you please make sure it's redecorated before I get back? Please do that, you know. So somehow the project had slipped, we were way behind, and he was due back the following morning. And so they assembled something like 20 to 30 monks inside that room. Try to imagine this. They all had paint, uh, buckets of paint and paint brushes, and they were all painting the ceiling. Some of them were holding cups of tea as they did it. And it was utter madness, but somehow they completed the job. And the following morning he arrived, and he seemed, apparently he was very pleased that, yeah. And then the next one is also of that particular part of the monastery, the monk's reception room, and particularly the steps outside it. So I was anagaric, I was doing a lot of driving, and Ajahn Suchitu and I went down to Heathrow to meet Lung Por coming back from Thailand. This is the early 90s. Uh, along with a monk called Venerable Subato. So Tan Subato is not the English Subado, some of you may know, but an, a New Zealander, a very capable carpenter a very sort of uh, physical guy. So as we went down towards the, the airport, Ajahn Shito was saying, well, Tan uh, Subato is so uh, energetic and so strong and he undertakes so many projects and wondering what he was going to do when he got back to Amravati. So um, we got to the airport and we were waiting and then finally we saw Lung Por appear and Lung Por was pushing a wheelchair and in the wheelchair sat Venerable Subato, absolutely exhausted, because he had malaria. He looked terrible. So I uh, sort of got down beside him. I said, what, what can I do for you? And he said, just uh, get me somewhere I can lie down. I haven't been able to lie down for 18 hours, something like that, because he'd been sitting in the plane and sitting in the wheelchair. So then we got the, this white mini bus with uh, two bench seats at the back and got him lying down on one of the bench seats and then headed off towards Amaravati. And along the way, Ajahn Sucito was cracking jokes, such as, don't worry, we'll build you a beautiful coffin. And someone said to someone, tell the Anagarika to drive more slowly, please. He's going too fast. So uh, I did. And... Uh, we got to Amravati. So the plan was, there was a huge playground, instead of this cloister and so on, there was a huge playground. We were supposed to circle the playground and come to where the steps were, and then there was a huge group of people waiting at the steps to greet Lung Por, welcome him home. So instead they said, no, don't do that. Park the vehicle, park the van, on the other side, near the, near the grass, uh, near where the the swimming pool was, this little swimming pool that's now a fish pond uh, in Ajahn Amara's garden. And then we'll get him out of the, get him out of the minibus and we'll get him into the Vihara and give him, take him to his room. So that's why I parked the, 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 the minibus and I could feel behind me this sort of group of people utterly aghast, what's going on? So I had to jump out of the van and run towards them uh, sort of shouting, get a wheelchair, he's very sick. So they did, they sprang into action, grabbed a wheelchair, and we got him into his room. And then the final one is, of, well, more or less final, is the Sala. This was about 92, 93. And even though we'd insulated, or the Sangha had insulated the Sala, it was still very cold at times. The, the heating system was hardly worth having. So, um, for example, you may wonder, some of you may have wondered why a certain room with cupboards in it was called the morning room. Well, it's because in the morning they thought it was a bit warmer in there and they would have breakfast there, everyone wearing these kind of thick garments they had. 
Uh, that was the kind of thing that was going on, you know. You, wouldn't, you didn't expect comfort. So they really looked forward to the installation of a proper heating system. And the money must have come in, and so they set about uh, ordering this heating system, and it was installed, so the, the gas tanks that we know were put in, the boiler was put in, probably the radiators were put in, massive amount of work, probably several hundred thousand pounds, I'm not sure how much. So then the, the, the day arrived for the starting of the heating system, and um, so they, they pushed the button and all the rest of it, and nothing happened. And there was no heating. And so they phoned up the company, and some guy comes out to try and make it work. And this happened every day. The guy would come out to try and make it work. And uh, he said at the end of it, he said, I, I, should, I probably should have had a camp bed and slept in the monk's scullery. He came out so often. So Ajahn Amro was offering a reflection around this on dukkha. He said, this is the best, the most advanced, uh, the most efficient system you could buy. There's only one problem. It doesn't work. And so I'd like to sort of really remember all those people who worked so hard to create this place, to make it what it is right now. In particular, obviously, the senior monks, that's Longpo Samedo, Ajahn Sujito, Ajahn Amaro, Ajahn Bajiro, and Ajahn V, and of course, senior nuns, Ajahn Sundara and Ajahn Chandasiri, uh, made such major contributions. And of course, all the people who put in such hard work all through that period, under quite difficult circumstances, sometimes having to do jobs that were very uncomfortable and very difficult. And I'll just mention two people. There were so many jobs that were uncomfortable and difficult, but I'll just mention two people. So the first one was Ajahn Chantapalo, who is now the, currently the abbot in Italy. And his job, he, he was the plumber. He was the engineer. And he had to get down under these buildings with all their pipes and taps and everything, with wrenches and spanners, lying on his back uh, in freezing weather, trying to make the heating system work. So he was known as the, the plumber on site and became quite famous. Whenever they had a problem, Ajahn Chandapalo, <laughs> could you go and sort it out, please? And then the other one I'd mention is the maintenance man who was here for many years called Lee. And some of his work was particularly revolting and difficult. And at times he had to crawl through rat urine to get work done. So I think this was quite heroic too. And then the final recollection is, I, I overheard once, it was the middle 80s, I overheard a, heard a conversation between Lumpur Sumato and Ajahn Chandasiri. And he was just sort of telling her something, sort of opening his heart. And he said <clears throat> that he'd woken up early that morning and he'd felt... That would have been very early. He felt called to go out into the field to the, what was the stupa. We, in those days, we had a very primitive stupa. Well, it, was, it looked good enough, but it was called the biscuit tin stupa, being full of biscuit tins. And he must have gone out to the stupa, and he stood there, and he just felt this sense of blessing. You could talk about devas or forces of goodness or whatever you like, but he just felt this tremendous sense of blessing that setting up this place in this society, he was doing something very good and f he felt this sense of blessing from, from whatever the force is there. So what about Amravati? What has it contributed to the society around us? So I thought I'd just talk briefly about that. So if you think about the society without any real monasteries, um, there were Buddhist groups, there was the Buddhist society, nobody or very few people in robes, and a lot of people, what, what Lungpur referred to as closet Buddhists, they would hide away in their houses, probably reading a bit about Buddhism, trying to meditate, 
but not sort of openly just say something like, oh, I'm interested in Buddhism, that kind of thing. They, they didn't know where to go or, or who to join with. That All that aspect was lacking. So Long Po's, one of his... Uh, one of his slogans was, it's time to come out of the closet. So, <clears throat> first of all, let's think about um, Saturday workshops. So Saturday workshops, by about 2019, that's uh, the meditation classes on a Saturday in here, could draw approximately 70 to 80 people. They started off with two or three, probably, uh, initially in the 80s, but 70 to 80 people will come on a Saturday afternoon at least to try to learn to meditate or to hear something about meditation. Then um, Lung Po opened the retreat center buildings to as many different groups as possible. And um, we had teachings there. There were teachings there from Thich Nhat Hanh, there was a group called the Brahma Kumaris that came through there, I remember. But also the family camp came year after year. There were family events. So I don't know how many children and families and parents, single parents, used that. And the connections between people were very strong. We, didn't, we never had to advertise the family camp because people wanted to come back year after year see their friends, connect with the place, and have quite a lot of fun, actually. Then there were school groups. School groups have been coming for decades as well, so many school children were exposed to a Buddhist environment. Pretty rare. And they heard for the first time that people could live without money. And then... There's such a thing as, you know, you can actually live on generosity. People are generous to each other and they're not asking for payment. And then we had um, adults coming for retreats in the retreat center. Um, many, many different retreats were taught there. Obviously, Lung Po Sumedho and other big names were the biggest ones, but many different retreats. Thousands of adults passed through that retreat center. Many different retreat center managers passed through it. We had many day visitors. People offering dana and just people just coming for a visit. And then you had people who weren't particularly interested in engaging either with the Sangha or even indeed with the teaching. But they, there are people who would come and park their cars and then go for a walk around the grounds or around the field because they said it was peaceful. They picked up on the peace. So some people would just come for, say, 20 minutes, walk around the grounds, get in the car and go back. And then we had lay groups, the... Uh, ALBA, which is the something Amaravati Lay Buddhist Association, and then the Buddhist Women's Network, that's another one. So these groups would regularly meet as well. And then there was another one, the Bodhinyana group, that would meet every week in the Bodhinyana Hall. So all these things happened, and I believe will have helped the society enormously. So some people criticize Amaravati, they say, well, look, monks should be living in kutis, they shouldn't be living, you know, in these rooms or, or, or they say things like, well, you know, it's too luxurious here. It's getting too luxurious. Your buildings are too good. And some, there may be some truth in this compared to some monasteries. But then consider what's, what the effect on the society has been. People coming from all over Europe to stay here, not just in Britain. and many people passing through the robes as well. So last Wednesday, uh, we had a talk from Ajahn Yanadasano. I found it very interesting and very stimulating. And there are a whole series of topics that he touched into. 
But there were a couple of them that I wanted to also talk about. He talked about disrobles and he talked about people's search for happiness. So let's start with disrobles. So when people decide to disrobe from the Sangha, it can have a quite a profound impact on others, particularly if over time that person has meant something important to others within the Sangha. Bonds of affection and many other bonds build up between us. So when we uh, are faced with two or three disrobals, the question arises in some people's minds, well, have we done something wrong? Is there something not working? Have we not paid attention, enough attention to people? Or were the teachings not quite right? Or was something else not quite right? These questions arise. And I think in that context, it's good to remember that in the Buddhist time, there were plenty of disrobals. So this was the this was a Samma Sambuddha, perfectly enlightened, self-enlightened Buddha. And yet people disrobed. There's plenty of evidence for that. He talks on numerous occasions about why it is people disrobe, offering various causes and reasons. And we know that some disrobed because of going back for you know, the, the five-stranded cord of sense pleasures. Others disrobed because they couldn't understand the teaching or couldn't do the practice. And some went to join other groups, looking back at the Sangha and uh, making disparaging remarks about it, critical remarks about it. All of this is evident through the suttas and vinaya. And so the Buddha, there are also obviously people coming back, wanting to come back. They're disrobed, they wanted to come back. So he laid down a rule that someone could ordain up to seven times, but not more than seven. And then <clears throat> in the lifetime of Ajahn Chah, so Lung Po Chah, a great teacher in Thailand, a totally, a absolutely magnetic teacher, there still were plenty of disrobals. And there was a story that Lung Po Sumato told where he and you know, he's sitting near to Lung Po Cha. Lung Po Cha was giving a talk to all these young men who are planning to disrobe, so saying something like, Well, you want to go back into the society and fire more bullets? Something like that. And Lung Po Sumato is sitting next to him and thinking, Well, I'm, I'll stay with Lung Po Cha, no problem. Quite happy. <laughs> Thank you. So some disrobals will affect us more than others. And I'll just talk about a couple of them that affected me. So this is, it tends to go back to the earlier years, because it's in the earlier years that you're more, you know, you have a, you build up more dependence, if you like, or more, perhaps greater attachment. So that's something to mention, that it's the clinging and the attachment that, that makes the problem. Um, we don't know what motivates anyone to come into the Sangha. Ultimately, we don't know. We might think, oh, they want to attain to Nibbana, but it might be something else. And then also, we don't know their karma. We don't know the background they've come from. We can't possibly know it in full. And there is a Tibetan, apparently, the Tibetan definition for renunciation, which is to accept that which is coming into your life and to let go of that which is leaving it. So anyway, for me, two important disrobals, and I've seen quite a few. One was Ajahn Santajito, and the other was Ajahn Atabemo. So Ajahn Santajito, I worked with him in that library quite a bit trying to get the library going. I drove him places to meet other librarians. And finally, in, later on, I went down to Devon, where he was abbot, 
and spent time with him there as an anagarika. So one thing Ajahn Sanchachito could do to me, or for me, was he could offer reflections. I needed a few reflections, but it wasn't always easy to offer me reflections. But he could do it in a kind way, and I was very grateful for that. And when he finally decided to disrobe, to go and live with a quadriplegic lady, lady in Wales, he came to Chithurst, where I was living at the time. He went around all the monasteries, and he sat in a particular room, and anyone could go and talk to him. So I did go and talk to him and tried to sort of shake his determination a bit, but of course, by that time, people had made their minds up, so you don't get very far. But at least I had a go and um, had some emotional satisfaction from trying. <clears throat> and then Ajahnata Pemo, I knew perhaps even longer because when I first started coming here in the mid-80s, he and I happened to meet. We were both heading for the sala and uh, it was tea time and we sat down and had a cup of tea together and I think he gave me some kind of, some bit of paper with, I think it was the 28 Buddhas on it or something like this, very kind of him. And... Uh, and then I said to him, well, well, actually, I'm coming back in two weeks or so. I'm, I'm hoping to be Anagarika. So he's very pleased by that. So, um, so I came into the community and obviously spent, spent some time with him. But met him again down in Chithurst. Uh, and then I went back to lay life. I'd spent 20 months as an Anagaric. And I wasn't ready. I did not feel ready to be a monk. So I went back to lay life for about four and a half years. But I did stay in touch, and sometimes in touch with Ajahnata Bemo, and came here as a visitor sometimes, and then came back. And then he was very generous because he organized this kind of little reception for me. The way he did this was he was going to Milton Keynes to an interfaith meeting, and he said I could drive him, and then we attended the interfaith meeting, and he said various things there. And then we went into a local forest, and he brought along some... Uh, flasks of hot chocolate and a few allowables and we struggled through this forest in the dark and then we had a few drinks together and that was very nice, nice way to welcome me back. And then fast forward to 2000, I'd come back from Italy and um, I was living here and I was his Upatak. And what had happened in between was that the whole temple project had temporarily collapsed. They applied for planning permission to build this temple and it was refused. The plans they had were reckoned to be, you know, the temple was too high and it wasn't suitable and that kind of thing. So it was he who picked up that project. Ajahn Swedu asked him to pick it up and he made it work. He and Ajahn Jachindra and one or two other people and they t took it to the local council and they argued in the court and all the rest of it and finally that uh, a reduced height temple plan was accepted so we got the planning permission, and then the, the work began. And he was in, well, played a major role in all of this right up until 98, 99, when the, the, the big temple opening of this building was in 1999, when many monks came from all around the world. We had about two or three days of celebrations. Many gifts were given, and talks given, and so forth. And there was a big sort of ceremony in here with things being put in the floor. <clears throat> but at the end of that, it was almost like Ajahnata Bemo had done his bit. He couldn't sort of work out what next to do as a monk. Uh, he did go off on a trip to America to try and sort some problems out, which didn't really work out. And then he came back. And I was his upatark and also trying to help him through this moment or this time of disrobal. It was very, very busy, very compressed. Um, and Ajahnata Bemo could be very open. He could say things that probably most monks wouldn't want to or dare say. So he gave a talk from the high seat. He said, um, I've never really, uh, I've never really conquered sexual desire. And then he decided to disrobe in public. And this is very unusual. People usually disrobe behind closed doors. So it was set up and uh, advertised, Ajahn Azabemo's disrobal, and um, Lung Po was at the front. There was a kind of horseshoe of the Sangha around, 
Ajahn Atabemo in the middle, and then behind us, masses of lay people, because he had made such a big impact on the, on the lay community. And um, so we chanted the Pritas to send him off. And then he knelt in front of Lung Po and said these fated words, from this day onward, I give up the training. You have to say it three times. And on the second sentence, he broke down. But he got through it, and Lung Po said, well done, well done. <laughs> and then he was a layman again, took the five precepts. And I turned around and looked at all the lay people, and on the male side, all their faces were kind of scrunched up. And on the female side, they were, most of them were crying. So that was a, a disrobal that did affect me quite a bit. But what we're talking about is grief and bereavement, sorry, grief, sorry, attachment and grief, uh, love and loss. And how is it any different in the lay life? What makes people come to this monastery? Often it's the breakdown or breakup of a relationship, or someone they really care about has left them or walked out on them, or there's a loss or bereavement of somebody very important in their life, or it's some other kind of trauma that they've been through. Of course, there are also people who are just genuinely interested in Dhamma and they haven't been forced to come here by any, any trauma as well. But often it's these moments of crisis in people's lives that start to open the heart and get them interested in hearing Dhamma in a way they'd never heard it before. So there was a lady, I, I went, the first retreat I did with Ajahn Samedo was in a house in Bepton, which is a few miles from Chithurst, and the, the owner of the house, her name was Julia, and she opened up the house to offer the house for retreats every Easter. And um, so I got to know her a bit, and then a few years later, she went, went on a boat with her father and a friend of her father, and the men didn't realize that down below decks, uh, at the bottom of the boat, there was a lot of gas had collected, and something lit the gas, and there was a huge explosion. And uh, no one was killed, but she was very, very badly shaken and traumatized, and she came here to recover. And when I saw her first, I thought, she was an old woman. She looked so different, sort of leaning on someone's arm. The face was utterly different. She stayed with the nuns, I don't know how long, maybe two or three weeks. And by the end of it, uh, she was almost back to her normal self. It was amazing how, how this place helped her. Just the other week, we had an old maintenance man here, Dan Sinnott, who uh, many of us are very fond of. So I hoped to have a chat with him. But what I didn't realize was he was here for a particular reason, and that is a bereavement. So he apparently he'd lost a nephew of his who died at the age of 31 back in the States. And obviously he was in deep grief at that moment. He obviously he opened this up to Ajahn Amaro and I hadn't realized or understood why he was here. So at times like this, people come to monasteries because they get support. They can join with other people who will listen to them, who will pay attention to them, rather than to the gadget all the time. And, um, and they can join in and do work. And it's a very wholesome place for people. It supports them at times like that. So the other item I'm going to talk about is happiness. So most of us want to be happy. Perhaps there are one or two people who say, oh, I don't mind being unhappy. But even that expresses a kind of contentment. And when I hear, you know, when I think about this, I think of um, one of my relatives, if you like, a stepsister. So my mother remarried, and uh, my stepfather had two daughters, so we came together as sort of two households that came together. And... Um, 
my, the elder stepsister Carol had unfortunately lost her mother at the age of 13 and it had marked her deeply emotionally. And also I think she felt that her father favoured her younger sister. Um, and this left her with an approach to sort of finding boyfriends that wasn't terribly skillful. Her relationship with men wasn't that successful. And um, she had to go through quite a lot of suffering. But I remember my mother trying to discuss this with her. And Carol said something like this. She said, I only want to be happy. Um, and of course, most of us do want to be happy. So in the um, <clears throat> Declaration of Independence, the American Declaration of Independence, it talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So is this how we in the West see happiness? It's something over there, and if you pursue it fast enough, you can get hold of it. It becomes part of your life. Is that how we see happiness? And certainly I can think of one of my relatives who kind of mirrored this, this idea in the sense that he seemed to see happiness somewhere over there. It was like um, in a desert, seeing a mirage. And so he'd start running towards this mirage, and then as he got to the mirage, it disappeared. But soon enough, there was another mirage over there. And he'd start running towards that one, <laughs> and so on. So the, um, the Buddhist words on this, and I, I can't get the exact quotation, but something like this, that human beings seek happiness. They want happiness more than anything, and they, so they try to find happiness. But unfortunately, they set up the causes, in the way they find, try to find the happiness, they set up the causes and conditions for the opposite to arise. Because we don't understand properly, do we? We don't see the truth of things. We don't understand the way things work. So there are more skillful ways of trying to find happiness and there are less skillful ways. So let's think about a skillful way. A skillful way is you do it legally. So you maybe decide to work hard and save and you buy the house and you get what you want and you have the partner you want and so on. But then there are the less skillful ways as well. So <clears throat> we get into the territory of precepts. And so I guess people who get into sexual misconduct, say grooming young people, uh, grooming children on the internet, taking advantage of people and abusing them, they think that this is going to make them happy. But sooner or later, it comes out and then it becomes public, and then they either lose their reputation or they're in court or whatever, and possibly in prison. And then there's theft. Now, many, many things get stolen. Cars get stolen. Goods get stolen from people's houses. There's um, a lot of internet fraud. Uh, many kinds of, of theft occur. And again, these people think, it's going to, this will make me happy. I'll get plenty of money, I won't have to work too hard, and so on. And that's maybe true, but also there's the fear. What if I'm found out? What if they discover? How can they ever be really at ease? Or people who create a web of deceit and lies and try to live, if you like, behind that. And then again the fear, and then what happens when they get caught in the web? And then finally, what about people who kill in order, they think, to become more happy? So somebody's in their way or they want to leave a partner or they want to get hold of a, you know, a, some money, some insurance or something, so they kill somebody else for that. They think it will make them happy. But what about someone who makes war on a neighboring country, invades a country, dislocates the lives of millions of people, 
causes untold suffering and thousands of deaths, that person must think also it's going to make them happy. I remember when I left, uh, um, I left the monasteries to, uh, as an agaric and I, I went out into the lay life and uh, I managed to get a job and then I got through a relative, I got a flat, a small flat in South London and uh, when I first uh, came into the flat and sorted it out and so on and then you, if you weren't working in the weekday then you had the, the weekend and it was very nice, you know, the, suddenly the Suddenly you didn't have to, to obey all the monastery rules and you didn't have to have a tea at a time when they said you had tea because in, in those days you couldn't help yourself to tea at any time of day. They brought a tray out. So you could be in the flat and you could choose exactly what you wanted to do. You know, you could go out into the shopping area or you could phone someone up or you could read a book or whatever you wanted to do. So this feeling of great spaciousness and freedom and it lasted about two weeks. And then Saturdays after that became just normal. And of course, life crowds in on you. So you, it doesn't become, it's no longer special at all. You just have to do, you're making the best of the life that you have and trying to do the, the job that you have and so forth. So anyway, what's the Dhammic take or on on happiness. So in terms of Dhamma, it's seen as one of eight worldly winds. So there are four pairs that come together. So the first would be uh, gain and loss. So it's like the two sides of a coin. Gain on one side, loss on the other. Uh, then praise and blame. Then uh, fame and obscurity. And finally happiness and unhappiness. So we grasp for one side of the coin. We want gain, or most people seem to want gain, but if you get in, into gain, for example, through the stock exchange or through gambling or through property or some other means, often also you have to endure loss. By grabbing onto gain, it carries you into loss. Somebody outmaneuvers you somebody tricks you, somebody tries to take away the property you've got, or maybe the state steps in and takes it away from you. And then praise, most of us want praise and we certainly don't want blame. So when you become an abbot, you may get a lot of praise, but then you'll get blame as well. Anyone in a position of authority or responsibility may get praise, but then they also get blame. Someone who's creative, writing books, making pictures, making music, at one time they get praise, but later they get more or less praise, maybe even blame, because the people don't like their products so much. So one thing carries you to another. What about fame? Um, in the society we live in now, people want to be famous, they want to be a celebrity, and they'll do just about anything to try and achieve that. So you have the talent con uh, con um, competitions, um, people becoming pop stars, um, sports people, uh, and other people trying to be famous for something or other, and sometimes they achieve it, and we have this expression, being famous for 15 minutes. But then sooner or later, for most of them, uh, fame gives way to obscurity. They're not important anymore. Their, their name isn't spoken anymore. And then we come to ha happiness and unhappiness. So in terms of happiness... So often we identify things like physical things or material things. If I have those material things, they will make me happy, those particular things. So Lung Po Cha, in his uh, 
training years took on some pretty grim practices. His mind told him that uh, sweet mangoes would make him happy. Uh, he he kind of was coming into the village with the, in the arms round um, in the Bindabart line and oh look at all these mangoes and really looking forward to it. His taste buds really sort of salivating. So he decided to take as many mangoes as he could, go back to, to the monastery and then eat as many mangoes as he could. He said, you think that mangoes make you happy? So he didn't stop at 10 or 11 or 12. His bowl was full of mangoes. Keep eating, keep eating, until he was, his stomach was groaning. It was his way of learning. And he did the same with, um, there's a pyramid suite they call Kanomsai, apparently. And this is a sort of little sticky sweet with a sweet thing in the middle and it's wrapped in a banana leaf. And again, he was very keen on, on that kind of food. So he filled his bowl with the kanomsai, went back and again, keep eating, keep eating, until he was in utter agony. <laughs> and this is how he learnt. So, that which, so where is the happiness? Is it in the item or is it in the mind? Is it in the thing we get our hands on or is it something in the mind? That's the question coming out of that. So the problem is, I think, in the clinging and the attachment and the grasping. It's the clinging and the grasping after certain things. The materialist conception of happiness. If I get that, if I get what I want, then I'll be happy. And it's in the clinging and the grasping that we set up the conditions to experience the, exactly the opposite. So, um, coming now to some guidance from the Dalai Lama, he was saying all human beings want to be happy, but he was recommending that if you really want to be happy, then you should care for the happiness of others. Take an interest in the happiness of others. And he described it as something like, it is the ultimate source of all success in life. If we can take an interest in the happiness of others, be concerned for their happiness. Because we may think we are the only ones who suffer. We may have the idea that my problems are bigger than anyone else's, but in fact, everyone else has suffering too, and everyone else is trying to cope with their problems. And when we can put forth the effort to help others uh, with their suffering, when we care for the happiness of others, then it helps us with our own fears and insecurities. It strengthens us. Gives us a sense of worth. So as I say, he called it the ultimate source of success in life. And then there's Lung Po Cha on happiness. And he talks about happiness and unhappiness are basically the same thing. So he says it's like the head and the tail of a snake. You grasp onto the tail, but the head comes around to bite you. He says that unhappiness, sorry, happiness, is simply a more refined version of unhappiness because of impermanence and so forth. He says desire the world is born out of desire. Desire is the birthplace of the world. And if you can bring an end to desire, you bring an end to the world. If you bring an end to the world, then you're enjoying ultimate peace. So on that very exalted note, I'd like to draw this to a close, wishing every one of you uh, good health and happiness and may you continue to practice and enjoy enjoy your lives.